Hi, I'm Shelley Garnum. Um, I'm the tuberculosis officer at Results Canada. I'm pretty excited for this webinar today. Um, I think it's very timely and um, we have some really interesting presentations. So I think we're going to try to spend as, the least amount as possible time me talking and we'll go right to our panelists. Just a quick overview, some of the key things that we're looking for to get out of this webinar. Um, we'd like to get a sort of a three part. It's tuberculosis, it's the high level meaning on tuberculosis coming up in September and it's gender. Um, so how do those things, three things intersect and what can we as civil society and Canadians and partners working together to fight tuberculosis do to make sure that um, we have the most successful high level meeting in September coming, that we are fighting tuberculosis in Canada and globally, um, some next steps and how do we engage further and hopefully we'll open up some lines of communication. Um, and some networking and share some, op some, <laughs> some opportunities with each other. Um, so please feel free to put your questions in the, in the chat box and we'll try to monitor them. The run of show in general will have an opening by Mandy Slitzker from Action Secretariat. Um, I'll throw to her in just a second. Um, she'll give a quick update on where we're at with the high level meeting. And Mandy, if you don't mind just giving a very brief um, basics, what is the high level meeting, it would be very helpful. And then we'll throw to our other panelists. We'll have a few minutes, about five to seven minutes of chat and Q&A after each panelist presents. And then, um, like Kate said, we'll have um, a more in-depth discussion if people are up for it to hang on the call um, a little around like 1.50 into 2 p.m. and on if people are up for it. So um, without further ado, I will throw to Mandy Switzker. She works for the Action Secretary of the United States, a global health advocacy partnership. And Mandy, if you don't mind describing a little bit about what you do and why you're here. Hi, thanks so much, Shelley. I um, work for Action, which is a partnership of global health advocacy organizations that work on um, TB, child health, and nutrition, and some other issues. I uh, am the co-chair of the HLM advisory panel um, for TB uh, for civil society and affected communities. And I have been working very closely with people at the WHO and Stop TB Partnership at the and the UN itself to make sure that civil society is very and affected communities are very engaged in the high level meeting. So just want to take a step back and explain what the high level meeting on TB is and why it matters and why it matters to Canada. So the high level meeting, um, the UN during the UN General Assembly and throughout the year often convenes meetings on topics and areas of of great importance to um, people all over the world. And sometimes these are health-related issues. There have been multiple high-level meetings on AIDS, for example, and a couple of years ago they had one on antibiotic resistance. After a lot of pushing from the TB community, because TB is the world's leading infectious killer, the UN has agreed to host a high-level meeting on TB. It's going to be on September 26th alongside the UN General Assembly, so heads of state will already be in New York. And this is really important because it's an opportunity while they're in New York to say, hey, just walk across the street and go to this meeting. It's already taking place at the UN, and we really want you to show up and to get involved. Well, the purpose and the goal of the high-level meeting is to get high-level political commitment and a political attention on TB and to have a declaration, an outcome declaration that heads of state sign and agree to. And when they are signing these agreements and when they are negotiating what goes into this uh, document, this outcome document, they have different blocks that do negotiations. And one of these blocks is Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, meaning that those three countries actually work together to figure out how, what kind of language is in the document, what things we ask countries to do. And so Canada is in a really strong bargaining position and position of power to influence what's in this declaration. We also hope that heads of state not only show up, but have commitments ready to make and share that day. So Prime Minister Trudeau could show up and say, hi, I'm here representing Canada. You know, we're very proud to sign this declaration. And also I commit Canada to 
you know, a certain amount of money used to invest in research and development to find a new vaccine for TB, something like that. So that's what we're looking for. Um, one thing to note is civil society and the broader TB community has agreed on five main key asks that we're looking to have be in this outcome document um, that everyone that heads of state sign on to in September. And um, I can actually add those, I think, in the chat box. We have it right now in English, Spanish, and Russian, and I believe French uh, is coming. So we'll definitely share with all of you once it is in French, because I know that is one of Canada's main languages. Um, and just to review what we want to kind of see at this high level meeting, the first goal is to reach all people by closing gaps on TB diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. And there are specific targets within that about how many millions of people we want to make sure get diagnosed and treated with TB. And that includes targets for children um, who are often forgotten <coughs> in this process. Um, and it's also very important that women are included in this as well, but we do not have a specific target for, for women. Um, then we talk about transforming the TB response to be equitable, rights-based, and people-centered, and that includes addressing kind of key populations such as um, healthcare workers, sex workers, prisoners, um, anyone who is at higher risk of getting TB and removing the discriminatory laws um, that often uh, take place and making sure people have equal access to new tools that come up. And the third ask is to accelerate the development of essential new tools to NTB. So that's all of the R&D work that is being done. Four is investing the necessary funds to NTB. So making sure there's enough money um, to get all of this done. And then five, which is actually the most important, is accountability. We want um, decisive and accountable global leadership, including regular UN reporting and review. So even if everyone signs this document and heads of state then go home, what happens after that? And making sure that there is review and there are scorecards and national rankings and ways to make sure that we can uh, you know, hold leaders accountable is, is definitely the most important. So I hope that is a good um, initial overview of what the high level meeting is. I know it sounds very technical and complicated, but as you know, countries, um, people do, you know, or heads of state show up to the UN General Assembly and getting them in a room and talking about TB is a huge win regardless of what happens. This is the first time that this disease, which is the world's leading infectious killer, is going to be discussed on the world stage by the heads of governments. So it is such a big deal. And while this document sounds kind of nuanced and technical, it really is something we can use to hold our elected officials and heads of government feet to the fire and say, you signed on to this, now we wanna see results. No pun intended. Thanks, Mandy. Um, that was a fantastic overview. Um, I'm going to move fairly quickly, but I wanted to know just does anyone have any questions for Mandy? She can't stay on for the whole time. So um, if anyone had any questions for her on the high level meeting immediately, I would say speak now or type in the chat box and we'll get to it. Um, and if not, then we'll move forward. Um, Shelly, it's Angela here. I'm just wondering where the chat box is. Oh, um, if you scroll your mouse down to the bottom, um, there should be a little uh, bar that pops up and on the far on right, right hand side, there's a little blurb that says chat. Oh. And if you I'm click on, on that. I'm on my iPad, so maybe. Oh shoot, um, the iPad one is a little bit more, um, I think maybe it's at the top. Okay, okay, well, don't, don't hold things up. Okay, well, um, if you do get it, um, be sure to write in there. And if not, I mean, you can ask your question right now. Uh, no, I just wanted to not okay. miss anything. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yes. Um, okay, well, we'll move on. Thank you so much, Mandy, for giving us the bit of a, a global perspective and then some really specific things for Canada as well. I think that helps position the rest of this conversation. It's still um, in there. I wonder if I could make a comment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, Trevor Stratton from the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, and I'm also uh, 
North American delegate for the um, UNAIDS Program Coordinating Board on their NGO delegation. I was uh, one of the, um, I was on the stakeholders task force for the HLM on, on HIV in 2016. And one of the things that really made an impression on me, of course, was the difference between the outcome document from the civil society hearing and the and the actual HLM document, they were quite different and it was uh, very disappointing to civil society who didn't quite understand how it would go. But um, it was during, you know, they had the silence procedure on the draft of the document, meaning if no one breaks silence, then they will have a vote as soon as you get there to the, to the high level meeting. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've heard if that's, uh, if that's a desire of the chair of the of the uh, high level meeting and the other the other piece was i was wondering if you have a plan on uh following up to the country positions so once once the um hlm political declaration is decided on and voted on and passed and then there's a there were a couple of days where um member states would be giving their positions distancing themselves or Aligning themselves with particular pieces of the political declaration and uh, I realized how important it was to document very carefully Their position statements so that we can hold them to account not only on the declaration, but on the on their position statements Is there a, a, a Strategy for following up on that as well as the indicators that might come out of the declaration? Yes, these are really really Fantastic questions, Trevor. Um, I'm going to also type in the chat box. Uh, there is a um, TV, uh, civil society listserv, and I sent a link that you can use to subscribe to that listserv. A lot of the technical and complicated issues and updates go through there. So um, in terms of how everything will be negotiated, everything is happening in June and at the end of June, negotiations end. So we will be sharing as many updates as possible. Um, the first week of June is gonna be a civil society hearing at the UN and there are going to be country negotiations and deliberations. And we are going to do UN mission outreach from mission to mission in New York that week as well. And then the next three weeks we have to really negotiate what is specifically going to be in the declaration. And I do believe they will not open it up unless there is major controversy um, in, you know, again, until maybe September. So by the time it actually, the meeting happens, everything will be agreed upon. And I don't think there'll be as many opportunities to influence from the floor. But again, that depends on what Japan decides. And I don't think they'll know until after the deliberations end in June. Um, in terms of the country statements afterwards, I do think uh, that is important and hopefully will all uh, be documented. Right now, the main thing that we're focusing on is trying to influence countries' input into the high-level uh, political declaration and that's the main thing that we're focused on and we have a lot of different um, a main spreadsheet that we're using to track who is reaching out to which countries who in the countries they're reaching out to and with these key asks I, I don't foresee it being as complicated as the HIV um, or the AIDS uh, high-level meeting because while we do mention um, key affected populations. It's not the same level of engagement um, as the HIV community specifically really wanting to see, you know, sex workers, people who use drugs mentioned by name. And I think that's something we want, but we can still get what we need without that being in the final document. We can still make what we need happen. So I think we shall see. We don't know how much kind of pushback um, this is going to, to have. We don't know how strongly people feel about this stuff, but we do know that there are multiple countries, including Canada, which do plan to champion all of this work. And um, we think that they will be pushing for the five key asks to be in the outcome um, declaration. And we're just going to have to see in June of which countries push back on which things. Great, thanks, Mandy. Does anyone else have any other questions? I think for the purposes of time, if you do have a question or think of one later, just put it in the chat box um, and put in there for Mandy. Um, 
and I'll make sure to record them and ensure that you get an answer even though she can't still be on the line. So we'll follow up with you separately in an email. Um, thanks very much, Trevor. Great questions and great responses, Mandy. And I think we'll move on. Um, we're gonna get a little bit more personal and talk about what TB is for people because I mean, that's why we're all doing this. So um, I'm going to introduce Kate O'Brien. She is a maternal survivor of tuberculosis. So she had tuberculosis um, while pregnant, um, which is uh, relatively, I guess, unique, but not all that uncommon. Um, and it's not talked about that much. So I'd like to throw it over to Kate O'Brien and she'll give you a little background on her story. Hi, um, everybody can hear me. Um, I hope um, that's generally not a problem. Um, I want to uh, thank you guys first and foremost just for the work you do every day for families like mine um, in both TB and HIV. And um, just thank you for being here today for all the work that you do. Um, so yeah, so uh, I um, was expecting my second child in 2015. And uh, my husband and I were both super duper excited um we were living in new york city and um and you know i just i just started feeling terrible and uh i think i feel like a lot of pregnant women probably have the same kind of experience where you just and this was my second child so i knew something wasn't right i knew this just wasn't normal pregnancy but it was hard to get my doctors to um to acknowledge that in the beginning um you know um i kept saying that you know i was having a terrible cough i did mention that i was spitting up blood but um you know, I got, I was prescribed uh, amoxicillin and, and uh, treated for, you know, like a, uh, some other routine bacterial infection. Um, and uh, I didn't have a chest x-ray because I was pregnant. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think the big way that like pregnancy and gender, just to tie back to this topic today, one of the big, that did kind of impede my diagnosis a lot being pregnant. I think sometimes when you're pregnant, people just kind of expect you to be miserable. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, I, I always bring up the fact that people would say to me, maybe you're having a girl. <laughs> um, uh, and that maybe that was why this one was so different and so difficult because my earlier pregnancy was a boy. Um, but you know, I was, I was having all very, very typical symptoms, night sweats, um, loss of weight. Um, eventually I was coughing so much that my throat was very damaged. So it was hard for me to, to eat. It was hard for me to eventually drink. Um, so, you know, I was just losing a lot of weight. I always say that I look like a spider cause I had like a, a growing abdomen and my arms and legs were getting like really, really skinny and gross. Um, but eventually, um, I, I remember one time I, uh, I went to a doctor and she asked me, um, if I had a, a history of eating disorders. Um, but nowhere in the story did anybody think it was tuberculosis. Uh, and, you know, I know that I'm not a typical affected population, um, but I do live in a, a city with people that are, uh, you know, uh, I was, you know, in New York City and commuting and hanging out and I had traveled. Um, I know that uh, maternal TB doesn't get, well, that frequently it can activate a, um, a latent infection. Um, you know, uh, and, um, so it's, it's funny that it doesn't, cause I, I hear statistics and there are, there are several women that are, um, diagnosed with TB while pregnant. Um, and, uh, and they still kind of believe that that might be underdiagnosed. So it's super important. And I'm very happy to see this topic, uh, being addressed. Um, so, uh, to make a long story short, um, it took a long time for them to figure out what I was, um, what was wrong with me, even in the hospital about two weeks. And I was on a maternal pregnancy floor. Um, we finally figured out what it was when I wound up in the ICU. Then I, um, I got a chest X-ray and it was like tuberculosis, you know, and then it was great. Cause then everybody knew what to do. New York city's had, um, you know, a lot of tuberculosis cases, especially in the nineties. Um, so they, you know, I was, I was secluded and I was uh, put in isolation. It was funny because in 2015, it was like the height of like in January, 2015, it was like the highlight of the height of like the Ebola um, kind of panic. And so there were like Ebola signs all over the hospital, but you know, here I was with TB, um, you know, just coughing it up and, and total typical case in every way, but 
my demographics, I guess. And um, nobody, nobody realized um, that I was right there. So um, the good news is um, I, I was eventually, um, you know, I was eventually diagnosed and then my treatment began, but my pregnancy, just to tie it back to my pregnancy, um, it made the, um, the treatment a lot more difficult, um, not because of my baby, but because um, my liver was more sensitive. So I couldn't take any of the normal first line drugs or I couldn't take many, I couldn't take rifampin. Um, I had problems with uh, PZA as well. Um, and I say PZA because I, I really have a hard time pronouncing that drug's name, like pyrazidamide. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so, um, and during this whole ordeal, um, you know, I was in the ICU. I did have a blood transfusion. I had um, all sorts of x-rays, CAT scans with contrast. And the whole time, um, nobody could tell me what that would mean for my baby. Nobody could tell me what the medications would do for my baby. Um, Women aren't included in pretty much any clinical trials I can really think of currently, pregnant women, um, for all the new medications that we're doing for tuberculosis. And they're going to take them anyway, I got to tell you. And then um, it kind of just makes each one of us like our own little, our children, an experiment. Um, and that's, it's hard. It was hard to have people tell me, like, so many people are getting this around the world and no one's writing down what the effects of these drugs were, that nobody cared about their children, and it just didn't matter, which is how it felt. Um, so it's, it's so good to see you guys here because I know it matters to you. Um, so it was, it was very difficult. You have to sign consent forms in the hospital, and I had to, like, sign these ones that said, you know, basically, you shouldn't do this when you're pregnant, but you kind of have to. And then I'd be like, well, as a video editor sounds good to me you know and i would just sign it and i it was terrible um and uh so it was hard to figure out a regimen because of my liver and i wound up being isolated for 75 days um away from my son my son um and you know obviously i uh, quit my job um there are a lot of financial strains it put on my family um i always say that like you know uh i'm a middle class american and, and if you got to get TB, you might as well be me. But it was still an enormous, you know, hardship on my family. Um, it was an enormous uh, strain on everything. Um, and uh, we have good insurance, too. Um, so it was difficult. But then when it was done, I, I, I did deliver um, by cesarean section a little bit early, but not too early, um, a beautiful baby boy. And, um, you know, now I'm doing TB advocacy. And... Um, I just really um, hope at this high level meeting, um, you know, there is a little bit of a talk about, um, you know, making sure we get the pediatric formulations to everybody, um, making sure that maybe when we're doing, we're talking about R&D and we're talking about clinical trials that maybe we, I, I don't know, that we just make sure women are at least represented um, equally, that that's like, a, like something we think about. And uh, especially um, if we could try to get pregnant women on it, sometimes drugs, not just things like side effects, but sometimes they don't, I know that um, pregnancy can affect how effective they are. Um, I just wanna push from my own personal experience that you will take them anyway. Um, so um, maybe just that's something we could think about. Um, and I just really wanna thank you guys for being here today and uh, all your work um, that you do. Um, it means so much to me um, and thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. That was um, very eye-opening. Um, and thank you for being so open and honest about this. I know sometimes it's not easy to talk about this kind of experience that just uprooted your entire life. So we appreciate being able to hear from you. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has a couple of questions for Kate right now. Kate can't stay past two o'clock. So again, if we have any, it's okay. If you have any questions for her. Um, let us know. Face. Like my kids do this with like FaceTime too. Like I'm like looking at myself. <laughs> I, 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 I am here to listen to you um, and I can hear you. Does anyone have any questions? It's okay if you don't. If you do, Kate will be on till two o'clock so you can continue to write them in the chat if you have any. Um, Kate, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think as um, a good follow up, um, we have Amrita Daftari, and Amrita, I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I know I forgot an A in there for a little while. Apologies. Um, she's an academic and researcher currently at McGill University. 
um, and she's done quite a lot of research in Canada and abroad and um, with women and key populations. So I think we'll throw it to Amrita to talk a little bit about the opportunities and challenges facing R&D and the research that she does. Thanks so much, Shelley, and thanks so much, Kate, for having me here and to Robin as well. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be on this uh, webinar and, and to join um, Kate and Leluki and um, Mandy and, and all of the staff at Results Canada. Um, it's a real privilege. I'm going to talk a little bit about the unique challenges that I think women might face in the context of TB and some important opportunities that the HLM could um, offer in addressing some of these challenges. Now, a big part of me really doesn't mean to strengthen any argument for TB and gender by comparing the experience of women to men and sort of downplaying, I think, the very real impact that TB has on men the world over. But as part of my own research over the last 12 years or so, I have spoken to dozens of men and women with TB and I'm convinced, the research has convinced me of the imperative to focus on the unique issues I think that face women at risk or infected with TB and to boost their role in tackling this epidemic. So this is, um, this is a quote that I'd like to share. Oops, I'm not sure if you guys can see this. Um, that I'd like to share from uh, a TB survivor who I've come to know quite well over the past few years and admire greatly. Um, her name is Nandita Venkatasan, and she was diagnosed with extrapulmonary TB in Mumbai, India when she was in her teens and treated with second line TB drugs that made her go deaf at the age of 24. And so Nadita has given me permission to share this slide. Um, and, and I show this just to showcase that in many countries, women face great hurdles accessing services on account of you know, competing social obligations, gender norms, poor access to all of the resources that they might need. And in countries such as India and South Africa, where I do most of my work, women face tremendous stigma from having TB and their stigma can get amplified because of their gender. It's often much worse for the 400,000 or so women who live with TB and HIV. It's often much worse for the women who live in poverty, for women of color, for immigrant women, for indigenous women. Um, so, you know, how, how can communities, health systems, research organizations, how can we help move things forward for women? So I'd like to first consider civil society engagement and, and the role of civil society engagement and how to get this piece on the agenda at the HLM. So public health TB awareness campaigns have typically been all about educating people about TB transmission. And while they've been very well-meaning, they can unfortunately also fuel fears about the contagiousness of tuberculosis. And this can be quite detrimental, I think, to the well-being of women who live in countries where they inherently have less power and have less equity. So I think community messaging needs to be carefully worded in ways that promote positive messages about people with TB. And so Mandy's comment about the language around how the agenda gets set at the HLM, I think that's quite important. We need to alleviate public fears and dispel myths um, around women's capacity, uh, around their mor morality, around their sort of ability to marry or bear children. I think the messaging can also showcase the resilience and strength that women can have in overcoming TB. I mean, the HIV movement has been extremely successful in converting the rhetoric for women from one of blame and promiscuity to that of resilience and power. And there's really no reason that we can't do the same in TB. We're very fortunate to have more and more women with lived experience come forward and share their stories, I think, of survival, of transformation. I mean, I'm just so in admiration of, of Kate for coming forward with her story. Um, I just wanted to share these images of women that I've come to admire over the years who have taken that battle forward and, and sort of talked about their experience and their resiliency in combating TB. Um, Nandita, who I spoke about a little bit earlier, she counsels women every day through WhatsApp chats in India, um, telling them, other women with TB, about how they can deal with some of the social effects of their illness. So I think civil society engagement needs to include the voice of these women who have been directly affected by TB. And my mentor that I work with very closely at McGill, Madhu Pai, insists that every TB event, be it at the community, policy, academic, or research level, must begin with the voice of a TB patient. Next, I think we can advocate to institute changes at the health system level. And I think 
the TB world has really failed to be gender sensitive. Um, TB diagnosis, case management is all highly standardized. We are focusing on bacteriological cure, on treating the disease and not the patient, not the man or the woman in whom that bacteria resides. So I think providers can be sensitized to the unique concerns that women are likely to face in contrast to some of their male patients. A diagnosis of TB in a man could mean that he loses his job, that he might go broke, that he might suffer some loss to his sense of masculinity, but he will still likely be cared for by his partner, by his family. He will probably still go on to work, to study, to marry, and to have kids. A woman with TB, unfortunately, not only risks losing her job, she could very well suffer emotional and physical abuse from her husband. She might be thrown out of her house. She might be considered unworthy of marriage or motherhood. And this is not just relevant in a lower and middle income country. It is relevant, I think, in Canada, given that many TB cases are occurring in communities where gender gaps exist. So providers could be sensitized to the social consequences of TB when they're conducting routine services such as screening, contact tracing, infection control, treatment monitoring, direct observation of therapy, all of these activities that I think could be argued as being justifiable from a public health point of view uh, might also expose a woman to a host of social harms and careful planning, gender sensitive care, counseling women about the effects of TB on their sexual and reproductive health. Thinking back to some of the comments that Kate also mentioned, involving them in treatment I think could help to alleviate some of these social harms. Finally, I think gender is a key issue in TB research and funding. I mean, Canada is already doing a lot, I think, in this regard. Um, if we look at the Global Affairs Canada website, um, they are trying to push the global gender agenda forward. Um, but one of the most amazing things that I have recently had an opportunity to be a part of is the Stop TV Partnerships TV Reach Initiative. Um, I mean, Canada is a major funder to this um, donor, to this initiative, and the funding has mandated all grantees world over collect and report gender disaggregated data. And this is just a photograph from the kickoff meeting we had in Bangkok last year. Um, and McGill is a knowledge management partner for about 20 of these grantees. And over this last year, I have seen a fairly simple mandate drastically shifting the way in which communities are thinking about gender and TB. Projects are naturally taking on a gender sensitive approach to delivering their interventions. We're seeing more and more grantees using gender as the kickoff point to plan additional research to study how projects are being taken up by women compared to men, to identify what strategies would work to ensure women's equal, if not greater, participation in TB case finding and TB adherence interventions. Um, for a change, we're starting to see people think actively about including pregnant women in research. We're working with at least one organization in South Africa that is looking at exactly this. And traditionally, as we've heard from Kate, pregnant women are literally they can be considered untouchable in the world of research. Are, researchers are so afraid, you know, they're so afraid of liability and so unmotivated to adopt the necessary precautions to include pregnant women with TB that it's just simpler to exclude them. So one way that I think we can approach, um, I, I think this is sort of one thing that can change in, in the future, but I think one way to promote more gender sensitive research is to start collecting data on TB related indicators that are inherently more gender sensitive. And by this, I, I don't mean to display the numbers of men and women who are affected by TB, but rather to think about the type of data we're measuring in the first place. So naturally TB incidents, which is like the number of new infections um, diagnosed with TB, treatment success rates, um, rates of death, mortality, these are all excellent and necessary outcomes that we need to keep track of in compared, uh, and compare like outcomes in men versus women. But can we push for research that also traces reproductive health outcomes in women with TB, that measures their quality of life, their social morbidity, that evaluates the drivers of stigma in women compared to men? Can we encourage research that examines diagnostic delay and quality of care for women compared to men? This sort of research, I think, can really push the agenda forward for gender and TB and help ensure that future programming could possibly be geared to meet the unique needs of women. I'm going to end on just one point. I'm going to say that there is a clear onus, aside from all of the things that I've just talked about, to also promote the footprint of women in TB research and policy making. I am just amazed at the panel that um, Results Canada has put together here. But if one were to look at the leaders in the world of TB today, you're really looking at a room filled with older white men. 
superstars such as Lushika Ditu at the Stop TV Partnership, Teresa Kaseva and Sumya Swaminathan at the WHO, Joanne Carter at Results US, Kitty Van Wiesenbeek at KNCV, Christy Hansen at the Gates Foundation, activist researchers such as Jennifer Furen, all of my fellow speakers today, Kate, Mandy, Aluki, we are still few. A recent article published by the Canadian Medical Journal showed that female health researchers in Canada are funded significantly less often than their male counterparts. This gender disparity in supporting investigators is, to me, alarming, given how much that we boast our commitment to gender-sensitive investigations are. So I think it's time that Canada supports women with TB and advocates for the lives of women with TB by supporting the ideas, projects, and innovations of women including those with TV. So thank you. I'm just going to end there and I'd be happy to take some questions. Hi, it's, <clears throat> sorry, it's Marguerite. I'm on the phone from Gran. <clears throat> My question has to do with um, looking at the incidence of TB among uh, older women in, in, um, across the world who are suffering from TB. We know the connection of TB to, a, a, sorry, I've got something in my throat here. The, the uh, association of TB with HIV AIDS sometimes, but also in general. We're interested in, because we know that a lot of times older women aren't being counted in any data. And um, if you don't count them, then no one can pay attention both to whether or not they're they're getting the disease and the other thing is the impact of those women as caregivers for their families when when primary caregivers die so i wonder if there's any any research or thought about that that is going on and and what is a good way of inserting that element into research and statistical um exploration and the reporting on that kind of incidence with older women. Yeah, thank you for that comment. I think this you're spot on um, on something that is largely neglected in the TB world. Um, from what I understand, the data that gets collected, the cutoff point is typically 14, 16, 18. You know, those are the age groups that they cut off um, data, like girls under five, adolescents, and then everybody else. Um, well, and, and we care also women, um, nothing if they're older than 49, like they don't exist. Absolutely. You are, you are absolutely correct that this is something that I think um, is not collected adequately enough. We don't have enough data about that. We don't have enough information about what might be the specific um, issues and challenges um, in, in that age group. So I think just as much as we're pushing for a gender um, sort of uh, agenda, we need to I think align with the issues around age um, and, and make sure that the women, the needs of women who are older um, and at risk for TB or develop TB um, and caregivers, especially who are looking after most likely um, younger people with TB, have that. Effect yes. There. Yes. Thank you. Well, that. any advice about how, how we could kind of make those arguments at some point would be very helpful for us. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks very much. Good question as well. Thanks, Amrita. Um, I also encourage you, Amrita, if you come across any um, good resources to share them with us and we can share them with the group as well if any, with these questions or others as they come up. Um, after this webinar, we'll, in the next week or so, we'll be sharing a follow-up email with everyone so we can include extra resources for people. Did anyone else have any questions? And again, okay, if you don't and you think of one later, we can always address it later. Thank you so much, Amrita. That was phenomenal. I was note taking as quickly as I possibly could. Hello? Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. I do have a question um, that's related to, um, you know, you were talking about if there's any possibility of sharing resources. Um, my name is Kate Waller and I'm from Plan International Canada and we work on a lot of global fund projects. Um, they're brought on TB and HIV AIDS, and we're trying to make our uh, programs more gender responsive and adolescent friendly. And I just wanted to know if uh, you actually knew of any 
um, initiatives around the world, maybe in South Africa or India, where there had been efforts at the health systems level with healthcare providers or with the DOTS uh, community program to actually address some of these uh, barriers that you talked about um, in terms of, you know, uh, looking, addressing issues around uh, notification, adherence, all those things, you know, in terms of barriers that the different barriers that women and men face and mm -hmm. trying to create um, services that are more responsive that address those barriers. Yeah, there clearly there are definitely studies um, that have sort of looked at the social determinants um, of health seeking behaviors and sort of outcomes in TB in men as compared to women. Um, a lot of work, well, not sufficient degrees of work, but some work looking at sort of the drivers of stigma uh, in men compared to women and how that plays out. Um, you know, at the policy level, have there been reports or documents that are actually driving national agendas? Um, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's something that uh, a few countries are trying to do. Uh, South Africa is trying to do that. Um, but certainly if I, uh, I'm happy to dig a little bit deeper into this question and, um, and if there's some resources, I'm happy to share them with you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. That would be wonderful. Because that's um, something that we're trying to um, push for. So, and it, it's interesting what you're saying about the policy level, because um, what's great about, anyway, I won't talk too much, but just to say that, that that's something that we're interested as well in terms of influ influencing um, national TV programs and their policies. Sure. If you could just send an email, I'll put your name into this little chat box so I don't forget. I would be grateful. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Really nice to meet you. Thanks, Kate. That's helpful for us as well at Results Canada. We can start to um, reach out with uh, some materials as we find them as well for you. Great, um, good share. Yeah, I'm going to uh, pass it on to our next speaker. Um, we're really privileged to be able to be connected with Aluki Kutierk, or Kutierk, apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, she's up in Nunavut and she works for, she's the president of the Nunavut Nungavut uh, Incorporated. Um, and so I'll allow her to give a little bit further introduction um, so Aluki, I think you're actually on internet connection. Yes, yeah, she's on the video connection as well. So Aluki, take it away. And I think you can hear me. Can you hear me now? I've unmuted it. Yeah, so I can hear you. Working. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, I know we were a little bit concerned with the broadband because uh, we often have broadband issues uh, in Nunavut, but hopefully nothing gets cut off and you're able to hear me. Um, Thank you for inviting me to be a part of the webinar. I'll let you know that this is the first webinar I've participated in. Um, and I'm pretty excited to be able to do that. Um, I'm not sure what, um, I, think, I think I'll provide a context and if people already know this, um, I guess it will just be reinforced. But in terms of Nunavut, um, there are 25 communities across our territory. Our land mass is about one fifth of, the, of Canada's land mass. Um, the majority of the population are Inuit. 85% of our population are Inuit, and 70% of the population um, have Inuktut as, the mother, uh, as their mother tongue. And um, the significance of that I'll get into in terms of um, TB and how t uh, tuberculosis has impacted on Inuit lives. And I'll try and um, highlight how it's affected in women's lives. So I mentioned that we have 25 communities, but I just want to um, emphasize that these communities are very recent in our living history. Um, my father's generation was a generation that was still living out on the land um, with no municipalities, with no schools, with no um, RCMP with, without the infrastructure that we currently have. So very recently, between the 1940s and 1960s, um, there was a ship that was coming up right along the coastline up in the Arctic in Nunavut that would do testing of Inuit. And when they would do the testing uh, to test to see if Inuit had tuberculosis, they would, if they tested positive, they were then taken away. Um, 
to various sanatoriums. I have relatives, my grandmother and my, some of my aunts had been taken to Hamilton uh, TB Sanatorium in Southern Canada. And so that kind of provides the context, I think, of how tuberculosis has been, um, the, the experience, the innate experience of tuberculosis, where um, people would be tested, they'd be positive, then they'd be taken away somewhere they'd never been, um, surrounded by people that couldn't speak their language. Uh, and the people that they left behind um, didn't know when they would come back um, or even if they would come back. Um, recently, in September, um, I traveled with Stephen Lewis, who's from AIDS Free World, and he came to Nunavut to bring attention to tuberculosis and get a better understanding of the innate experience with tuberculosis. And we went to the community of Igluik and we spoke to various community members and community organizations. And it was quite um, apparent that even to this day in 2018, because people have lived through this, that there's still a lot of pain and anguish when people talk about tuberculosis. There was one woman who was speaking in Igluik who was, an, as an adult, crying because um, recalling how her mother had gone on the ship, had been tested, and then was taken away. And so as a young child, she was now motherless for a number of years, and she didn't know what was happening, what ha what, and there was no way of communicating what was happening, and people didn't know if people were going to come back. And currently, we're, as, a, as Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated, we're working with the federal government um, on a program called Nani Labut, which means uh, to find people. Um, let's find them. So one of the things that we've been working on is a database to help Inuit who lost loved ones or who don't know where loved ones are buried to try and get information about these tuberculosis patients and family members that never came home. Um, so this fast forward today, many people when you talk about tuberculosis still have this as their collective memory. So there's a lot of stigma around tuberculosis and the great fear of what it means to have tuberculosis with the lived experience of having people, family members leaving. And of course, when people leave, it's quite disruptive. Anyway, so in Nunavut, when, for instance, when we went to Igluik to talk about tuberculosis and find out more about it, it was clear that the social determinants of health have a great impact on um, how tuberculosis is experienced currently. Um, in Nunavut, we have a high housing crisis. So there are many people that live in one dwelling. And because of our Arctic environment, because for many months in a year, it's cold, many people, in overcrowded situations are inside the home and can be um, passing, I, I guess, breathing the same air. And so that creates an environment where tuberculosis can be um, passed on to other people. The other social determinant I wanted to highlight is um, nutrition. I know that's one of the areas that's talked about often when we're talking about tuberculosis. And uh, there had been a recent study um, that indicated seven out of 10 Inuit children in Nunavut are going to bed hungry. And I just want to highlight that when we're thinking about poverty, I think it's quite uh, well documented in other parts of the world even, where it's often the mother who eats less to make sure that her children are eating, or who might go without in terms of warm clothes to ensure that the children are well clothed or their husband. So I think that it's no different in any um, communities where women might um, put their needs um, last and put the needs of their children first. Um, in terms of health centers, it's usually the woman who goes to the health center and has the most contact with the health center in terms of their children. and. Um, I think one of the ways in Nunavut that we're trying to um, address some of the stigma is to create, is to provide more information and public awareness about tuberculosis. Because 
even though in our living history, um, people would be taken if they were uh, positive. That's not the case now. There's treatment that, people, that can be administered in our communities and people can remain at home um, and not have to leave their communities. Um, when, one of the things I wanted to highlight, and I mentioned this, that 70% of the population in Nunavut has their mother tongue as um, Inuktut. And I think this is very important in terms of delivering services and health services, particularly when we're talking about tuberculosis, is that um, healthcare workers need to be um, sensitive to the, um, the historical experience of Inuit but, and have to be trauma-informed in how they deliver the services. But ideally, they'd have the information available in Inuit so that people can actually understand what's being said. And this is very important when we're talking about public awareness. I know recently, I think it was in January 2017, there was a young Inuk, um, a 15-year-old girl who, who died in Nunavut, in Klikertagjok, as um, with tuberculosis. And so there was a news article in Nunavut about the circumstances in which this young um, woman died. And the mother speaking in Inuktut, her comment when she was asked, how do you think things could have been better? What do you think needs to be done to make sure that services are better in situations like this? And one of the things she said was that there needs to be Inuktut health workers, Inuktut speaking health workers, and that that would make it easier to understand what's going on. And I know that in Canada, um, the official languages of the nation is French and English, but I think in Nunavut, the uniqueness of Nunavut is that um, the majority population speaks neither French or English as their mother tongue or um, at majority of the time. And I think that's very important to bring that kind of um, information to the United Nations and to um, highlight that as an anomaly. I know in Canada, um, we're often looking at other countries when we're looking at infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, but I think it's, it's very worthwhile, um, particularly for innate lives, that um, we look at it within our own country as well. I know that when Stephen Lewis came to Igulik and Ekali in September, he had a videographer who was taking footage um, of all the community members that they had been talking with. And when I've been in communications with him, um, I know he's traveled to India and South Africa as well, and is planning to compile all that footage into a video that will be shared at the high level meeting in September. So um, for those of you who will be there, I, I hope you're able to capture or get more information about the situation here in Nunavut. Um, recently, Minister Phil Pot, um, along with Netan Obed, the Inuit leader, um, national leader, made an announcement that they were planning to work towards eliminating tuberculosis across Inuit Nunangat by 2030. And in the federal budget, in Can the Canadian federal budget, there was money allocated for that. I, I think that's a very good move and very positive. Uh, one of the things that I raised at our EMA Crown Partnership Committee meeting with the Prime Minister was that although this is great news, when there's no additional um, monies allocated to address the housing crisis, it makes it very difficult to understand how one will be able to eliminate tuberculosis when we know with overcrowded housing situation that it has a very um, powerful and negative effect on the spread of tuberculosis. Um, however, I think um, the attention on tuberculosis is really appreciated and we look forward to continuing to work to make sure that um, our lives are as important as other people's lives because we know that we have a very high rate of tuberculosis and we know it's preventable. And it's, in my view, a great shame, one of the great shames that it's still very um, 
prevalent across our communities. I asked recently for an update on how many active cases there are in our territory. Um, there are between eight and 10 communities across Nunavut. And I'll remind you there are 25 communities. So there are eight, between eight and 10 communities where there is still currently active tuberculosis. In February, the government of Nunavut um, opened up um, a TB screening pilot in the community of Kikistarjoa for a period of seven weeks. And the intention was to do a community-wide screening because that community is one of the communities where there is active tuberculosis. So it was a makeshift um, screening center. And when I, um, the, the director of, the chief medical officer on Tuesday, when we were at a meeting, identified that to do that one community, to do the screening in that one community in that way cost $2 million. And that's such a lot of money for one community. And um, the amount of money that was announced in the federal budget is a lot of money over five years. But you, when you start breaking it down by each year and you look at how many communities there are across Inuit Nunungat, I question how much, um, how far that will go. And I hope that we continue to work really hard to make sure that tuberculosis is something that is not as common as it currently is. I'll leave it at that. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Aluki. Um, that was fantastic and an excellent way to set um, the context of what's happening in Canadian northern communities and and also happening throughout Canada. Um, but it is specifically and um, it's so extreme in Kenya's Inuit communities, and it's it is it is shameful. Um, and so we are excited that that Canada has the federal government has started to make those moves and um, and we'll continue to follow that and see what we can do. And I know there's partners on on the call that are also working to see how to make sure that money is spent as effectively as it can be, because I think you're right. The social determinants of health are so important. And I mean, if we, we can have all the diagnostic equipment in the world, but if um, if people still have poor nutrition and they still have poor housing, then we're, we're just not going to get as far as we need to get. So um, I think that was very well said, and thank you so much for saying so. Would anyone on the line like to continue the discussion? I know we said it would go till 2 p.m., but we're available. Does anyone have any questions for Aluki or any of our other speakers as well? Um, I have something that's not quite a question, but I just want to let you guys know um, that we are trying to mobilize um, more people that have had tuberculosis, you know, survivors, current patients, um, to do more advocacy work, and that's a resource if you ever need it. Um, we're kind of underneath the, the National Tuberculosis Controllers Association right now, but the little group we have is called We Are TB. So if you're doing any kind of anything and you want to talk to more people like me, um, I can, um, we can hook you up. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks, that's so great, Kate. And thanks for still being on. Um, I had a question for you, Luki, just on that and support. I'm, and you might not know the answer to this, but I'm wondering if you know um, what kind of support network there is for tuberculosis survivors um, in those communities. Um, I know that Amrita had spoken about Nandita and how she reaches out via WhatsApp to people and, and particularly women from all over India um, on how, on, on social, emotional and actual just um, care support on how to go through the treatment. And they, she's reaching out constantly to TB patients. And I know that's something that is often missing, missing in the care system is that one-to-one um, -one support um, patient to patient or um, allied to patient. And I'm wondering if that exists and have you seen it or is there a way that we can help bolster that or I'm wondering if you have any comments on it. Um, I, 
in terms of um, formal support systems, I, I'm not aware of any formal support systems in Nunavut for tuberculosis survivors, but I know that because it's so rampant and so many people have had experience where relatives have had tuberculosis, that as community members, we talk amongst ourselves. So I think people find ways in which to get the support um, in Inuit communities family and kinship are still quite strong. Um, so I think that people find ways in which to find that support, but I think um, any formal supports would be, I think that would be a really good component of any kind of tuberculosis program. Um, having said that, I thought if there was a question I saw in the chat about the $2 million for the screening in Qitar Sarjah, um, from what I understand, it's the screening as well as the administer uh, administer administering of the um, treatment. And do you know how, sorry, when did that screening happen? You said this February? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yes. So um, in February, um, I was part of um, a group of um, political leaders, including the Premier of Nunavut, traveling to Qikir Sarja to take a look at the screening, um, the, because it's a makeshift screening right. area um, in the community hall. And there's, there were tarps and little cubicles made up, and there was um, um, equipment purchased to be able to do the screening right there in Qikir Sarja. Okay. And the mayor was very mm -hmm. involved in calling households um, because we have a very high birth rate and we have a very high uh, youth population. So when I talk about um, overcrowded housing, many of our homes have lots of little children in it. So um, they were trying to be methodical by doing household by household and have the community of, um, it's, there's 600 people, the population of that community is 600. So the intention was to try and screen all the people and pick up that job, who of course, um, we're willing to be, right? No, no one can be forced to take the screening. But um, so, so that was the intention. And then just recently on Tuesday, we went back there and we were, I think it's um, completed now. And that's why the chief medical officer was able to talk about how much it, would, it cost. Right. I have a question. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm Erica Silva. I'm a health advisor in Plan Canada. My, my question um, is, if you had found in Nunavut, if there is more cases in men than women, or there's equal number of cases of tuberculosis amongst everybody, and uh, if you have any insight of uh, if there are different patterns in women and men about reaching services. So, so I don't have that um, information, but what I'll do is um, I'll find it and I'll make sure I get it circulated. Because I know when I look at um, the statistics that I was provided, there seemed to have been a drop, but now there seems to be another increase in the number of people that have active tuberculosis. In 2017, there seemed to have be, um, be an increase. Okay. And do you know, um, you talked about high birth rates um, and, you know, we had Kate O'Brien on earlier. Do you, have you, you, and you might not know this and that's okay. Um, do you know anything about testing um, during pregnancy and maternal TB um, experiences in those communities? Yeah. Um, no, I'm not aware of anything like that, but I do know, and this isn't to do with women, but it's mostly to do with men that um, for the mines that are opening in Nunavut, right. part of working at a mine is that, um, and it's often men that go work there, that they have to do a pre-screening for tuberculosis. Right. Interesting. Okay, um, I'm just looking through the chat to see if there's anyone else. I've missed a couple of questions here. Um, thanks for catching that one. Did anyone else have any other questions? I have one more and then I'm actually going to have to um, run away here. I'm really sorry. Um, but I have one more for, um, 
for you, Aluki. And I just forgot it as I was saying that. What was I going to say? <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, um, I was wondering if there, in your community and in your circles, have you found anyone talking about the high level meeting on TV? Um, no, no. And yeah. um, no one's talked about it. The only reason I knew about it was because of Stephen Lewis traveling to Iqalu uh, and Igluik. And um, I've been in communication with him since September after I met him. And it, uh, that was the only time I heard about the high level meeting. Okay. Well, you'll have to, um, we'll have to follow up with you, but if you're looking for more information and if anyone is looking for information, um, I encourage you all to use um, myself and Kate as resources. Mandy also put in the um, civil society list serve at the very beginning of the chat there that you're welcome to add yourselves. That one um, is a global list serve, so it gets into like the high level discussions and um, a few more of the technicalities and stuff. But even if you just were curious and you wanted to ask a few questions, um, very basic to a little more technical, I'm happy to reach out. You can call me or email me. Um, they have the civil society hearing coming up in June um, and then the high level meeting. And you don't have to you know, attend either of them to have an impact, but there are, there's a couple of waning ways in which we can still influence this. Um, and so you can, I encourage you to reach out if you, if you are interested. And even if you think you have, you know, a, a dumb question or whatever, I'm happy to answer it. It's a very confusing process, all of it. Um, but the more we talk about it and understand it and help shape what, what Canada can and should be doing, the better. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you so much to everybody who joined us. And I have to, I have to run out. I'm sorry, Kate, to abandon you. Um, I don't know, Kate, if you want to stay on the line or if anyone else has a conversation. We'll sure, definitely sure. be sharing information after this. And I'm just going to type my email um, in the chat box here for everyone if they want to reach out for any reasons. Um, there you go. Um, please reach out um, or call if you like, and we can continue this. Thank you to everyone that joined, um, and hopefully we'll still be in touch with you in the coming weeks and months and years. Thanks, Shelley. This was great. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. So, and I'll send around an email with everybody uh, to everybody with our contact information as well. Does anybody else have any more questions um, before we we head off? Okay. All right. So then I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. This was a really wonderful discussion. Um, and uh, if there's anything else, again, get in touch. Um, and I'll be sending around an evaluation, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, we just like to, to see um, uh, what your thoughts are on this uh, discussion. And uh, we'll send the recording as well. And, and hopefully you can, you can share that information with everybody. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. It was very good. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.